Welcome or welcome back to the Comedy of the Gut. Hi, how are you? Today's video is about the geography, geomorphy and climate of Donate's Planetos and how this affected history as you can see from the title. A quick disclaimer, the maps are obviously completely theoretical for one simple reason. Martin has said that the world map is not objective but written as it is known to the maesters of the citadel in Westeros. And it gets increasingly less accurate the further east it goes. And the edits I did are again speculations based on all the information we have. I think that at least for Westeros is relatively accurate and it can explain many parts of the story, but especially from the bones and beyond, we are talking speculations more than anything. Without further ado, let's start because I'm going to be talking for some time. The biggest event we know 100% happened was the breaking of the Arm of Dawn, so let's start from there. And the old gods stirred and giants awoke in the earth and all of Westeros shook and trembled. Great cracks appeared in the earth and hills and mountains collapsed and were shallowed up. And then the seas came rushing in, and the arm of Dorne was broken and shattered from the force of the water, until only a few Baroque islands remained above the waves. The summer sea joined the narrow sea, and the bridge between Essos and Westeros vanished for all time. The old songs say that the green seers used dark magics to make the seas rise and sweep away the land, shattering the arm, but it was too late to close the door. Mandela effect aside, the hammer of the waters controlled the waters, it didn't control the earth. As we can see in both these instances where the event is described, the waters moved and shook, shattered and shallowed the earth. In my horns video I said that the hammer of the waters was most likely a horn, and now I believe even more that this is the case, not only all over the books hammers and horns parallel each other, but in the first quote here we can see the words used to describe the hammer are almost identical to the vow of the knight's watch. I am the horn that wakes the sleepers. Something that it makes sense to be about the horn of winter. We know the land connecting the two continents shattered, but the biggest change was not the drowning of this land part, but the humongous change to the ocean currents. We have two massive bodies of water, with a big temperature and most likely salinity difference, colliding. The sea rise not only led to the sinking of land, it also changed the weather, the climate overall, and as a result the ecosystems all over the globe. And we know these changes affect not only the environment, but humanity and culture as well, even more since they happened because of a single cataclysmic event and not gradually. It was very fast and violent because of magic. I tried to visualize the changes, but they look rough, so just so you know. <laughs> Whether the breaking took place in a single night or over the course of centuries, there can be no doubt that it occurred. The stepstones and the broken arm of Dorn gave mute but eloquent testimony to its effect. There is also much to suggest that the Sea of Dorn was once an inland freshwater sea fed by mountain streams and much smaller than it is today until the narrow sea burst its bounds and drowned the salt marshes that lay between. So the stepstones were a unified area and the Sea of Dorn was a smaller inland sea, kinda like what you're seeing on the screen, I think meaning the Stormlands and Dorne were connected by a flat, easy passable area with access to fresh water, making the entrance to mainland Westeros way easier. According to the maesters, the first men came with horses and on foot, which is obviously not that easy to do through Dorne, since we know it was called empty land by the children of the forest and still has a very unfriendly, harsh climate. And it's even worse for those that are familiar with this kind of climate and terrain. With the fresh inland sea though, I am guessing the area all around would have been more than welcoming as a passage and place to stay, with accessible fresh water, animals to hunt and some sort of edible vegetation too. And that makes the Stormlands the second part of Westeros the first men reached. The history of the Stormlands stretches back to the Dawn Age, the wet wild of the Rainwood was a favorite hand of the children of the forest, the tales tell us. The forest saved the first men who made their homes beneath the ancient oaks, towering redwoods, sentinels and soldier pines. By the banks of small streams rose rude villages where folk hunted and trapped as their lords permitted. So the Stormlands were hands down the first major settlement of the first men, making it the place where the conflicts with both the children of the forest and the giants began. Rainwood was part of a very large forest, stretching from Cape Wrath to Cape Kraken, and sadly the only parts remaining of this forest are the Rainwood and the Kingswood. The majority of the written stuff there hasn't survived since the first men used to carve stories on trees, but we do have many songs, myths and legends about House Durandon. The songs tell us that Durand won the heart of Elenai, daughter of the sea god and the goddess of the wind. By yielding to a mortal's love, Elenai doomed herself to a mortal's death. And for this, the gods who have given her birth hated the man she had taken for her lord husband. In their oath, they sent howling winds and lashing rains to knock down every castle Durand dared to build. And this is what makes me believe that Durand started to rise into power and wanted to build his fort around the time the Hammer of the Waters took place. And I also believe that Durand played a huge role in why the children of the forest called the Hammer in the first place. We know 
he didn't have the best relationship with the children of the forest. The Godgrave himself was the first to claim the rainwood that were wilderness that had hitherto belonged only to the children of the forest. His son Duran the Devout returned to the children most of what his father had seized. We see that not only did he claim the wood, but was the first to do so. Plus his name was Godgrif, and the gods had a feud against him, and this is why they sent storms and waves against his castles. I don't know if it was the parents-in-law, but I'm led to believe that it was the powers the children of the forest awoke when they called the hammer. If we look at the area, we can see that Tarth was actually part of mainland Westeros and formed a bay, and in the middle of this bay is Storm's End. The place is ideal for building a castle, it has a bay for protection, and even in the story it was after Durand's wedding that the gods started to send storms, so before the weather as well as the waves and wind were for sure mild in the area, making it a great place to build a keep. All in all it makes sense for the first very serious conflicts between the children and the first men to take place in the Stormlands, since Godgriff was the first one to claim the wood that belonged to the children up to that point, the children became desperate enough to use the hammer when Duran was powerful enough to the point of becoming a king. Add to the fact that more and more humans came and settled as time passed and it makes sense for them to want to protect themselves and their home. They broke the arm of Dorn, but also the land that connected the Stormlands and Dorn. And I think they did it on purpose too, even if the remaining humans on Dorn wanted passage, they would have to take longer and more difficult paths, so they broke this whole area and the sea level rose in general, so there were many more flat parts of land close to the sea that drowned all over Planetos. Moving to the Crownlands, the area was part of the big forest I mentioned before. Apart from Asis Hook, the area is, is relatively flat, and Driftmark, Dragonstone and Crab Isle are very close to the shore, so they were most likely part of the mainland. Cracklow Point too is very boggy and densely forested, so some parts were lost when the sea rose. I believe both peninsulas were bigger, and both the Bay of Crabs and the Blackwater Bay were smaller. I think that little changed at the Vale, to be honest, mostly because we are talking about a heavily mountainous area. Pebbles and pups were part of the fingers, we can see it even now looking at the map. The Three Sisters were one island from what I understand, and maybe the gaps between the fingers were smaller and less defined. Apart from this, I think everything has stayed pretty much the same. For starters, from what we know, the neck was not boggy, it was also a part of the major forest stretching from the Rainwood to Cape Kraken. The area where the Wolfwood is now, along with the stony shore and some of the forested parts north of the Neck and south of the Long Lake, were two parts of this forest, and from the look of it, the smaller forests around Last Hearth and Carhold were connected to the Haunted Forest. As for the coastal areas, Skagos was for sure one island, and the smaller ones around it were a part of it, and the Bear Island was probably slightly bigger, but not much because, again, a lot of mountainous and harsh terrain. In some of the flatter places, the sea level rising might have caused some sinking, but again, nothing crazy, I think. In the Westerlands, the terrain is rocky and mountainous again, so I think the coastline where Casterly Rock is located and the area around it wouldn't be that different. But the Straits of Fair Isle were flat since the closer we get to Case, the flatter the terrain is. As you can see, I have also put extra land north of Bainford, and this is because the Iron Islands were most likely a peninsula. I have a full video on the Iron Islands where I explain the geology of the islands. The islands are volcanic, quite mountainous, they have ore, and they were not that barren, they were actually very forested. And we have all this in the area beside them, the Westerlands. The isles are so close to mainland Westeros, and they have myths about them drowning, and most importantly, the oldest known castle, which is massive and half drowned. I think it makes sense they were a peninsula, plus it creates one more parallel to Valyria. The Ritz is another tricky area, in my opinion. It has some big estuaries, so in these places the sea must have drowned some land. For example, the Mandar estuary is a very big one, and we have four very small islands located very close to the mainland, so this place must have been bigger, very flat, with various tributaries. So the Sealed Islands were part of the mainland reeds. By the way, I use the maps from the Atlas of Ice and Fire since they have great quality and are easily editable. Geographically are great and very much correspond to the official maps of the lands of Ice and Fire. The creator has also placed some castles we do not know the exact locations of. I haven't talked about it in any other region since it's not that important, but I will comment on Dastonbury because I don't agree with the location assigned to it. 
As you can see, they have put the OG Manderley house underneath High Garden. There is no way it was that far into the ridge. House Manderley has a merman on their arms and their new keep is reminiscent of Dastonbury. And we know the floor has painted crabs and clams and starfish, half hidden behind seaweed and the bones of drowned sailors. On the walls are sharks, prowling painted blue-green depths. We have eels and octopods and sunken ships. There are herring and great codfish swimming between the windows. The surface of the sea is also depicted. And there is a war galley and an old cod racing before a storm. There is also a scene of a kraken and a grey leviathan locked in battle beneath the painted waves. It is obvious they were a coastal house connected to the sea and still are. Their name is Manderley though, so that leaves only one possible place for Dastonbury and it's where Mander flows into the sea. They were called Manderleys because they were controlling who was going in and out of the Mander. The legends we have about Owen Oakenshield, son of Garth Greenhand, Give us another clue. He is credited for conquering the Shield Islands and driving the Selkies and Merlings back into the sea. I have talked about the fact that all these stories are most likely about the Ironborn and not real Merfolk. If the Isles were connected to the mainland and this close to Old Oak, the seat of House Oakheart, first men were for sure living in the area. After the sea rose though, it makes sense for people from the drowned areas to have tried to relocate there and for Owen to have tried to push them back. If we look at the houses of the Sealed Isles, we see a clear influence of both First Men and Ironborn. And Manderley themselves are a mix of Garth references and Ironborn references. The Honeywine also is a very big river with various tributaries, and we know it empties into Whispering Sound at Old Town, and Old Town has various small islands. So there was more land there, and when the sea rose, the river and the sea became one. Arbor is the place that makes it very, very tricky for me. The island has many smaller isles scattered around it that were part of the main isle for sure. The thing is, I'm sensing that the area was also connected to mainland ridge too. I cannot prove it, I'm not 100% sure. The area is closer to the Torrentine than other major rivers in the ridge. And we know that the Torrentine is a very fast and aggressive river. It is formed by the confluence of two rivers near Blackmont that passes through a series of rapid waterfalls, canyons and crevices. Starfall is also located on the island at the mouth of the river, so I'm guessing there was some more land at the mouth, like in most estuaries. But, and it's a big but, there is always the possibility it empties with a waterfall, from what I understand. And if this is the case, then the sea rise didn't affect it. I'm not sure, and this is why I made two maps. <laughs> the reason I think Arbor was part of the mainland is again a son of Garth, Gilbert of the Vines, who was a legendary son of Garth Greenhand and the founder of House Redwine. He taught the first men of the arbor to make wine. We have other coastal houses founded by Garth's kids, like House Bulwer, for example. Only two of them are in islands, and if it wasn't an island, it makes more sense for the story, considering that arbor isn't that close to the mainland like the Shield Isles are, where you can go by boat. To go to arbor, you need sturdier ships, something that wasn't the strongest suit of the first men. The arbor was part of the lands the Ironborn claimed, and I don't believe that this early on, when the first men wouldn't have been very good at sailing and navigation, they wouldn't have been able to hold the area. If it wasn't an island though, and people were already living there and had the manpower, they could have kept it from the Ironborn, I believe. Westeros is pretty much covered. The Riverlands areas close to the sea are mentioned in the North Vale and Crown land maps, but there isn't much of a coastline in this area. So we're moving to Essos. The area where the free cities are located changed only a little, I think. The arm of course sank, Bravos of course was one unified part, since it's described very similar to the Netherlands. Very small islands are connected with bridges over the canals. And the Lorathi Isles were too part of mainland Essos. Sprawling constructs of bewildering complexity made from blocks of hewn stone. The maze maker's constructions are scattered across the isles, and one badly overgrown and sunk deep into the earth has been found on Essos proper on the peninsula south of Lorath. So the whole area was one. Some have suggested that mayhaps the maze makers were born of interbreeding between human men and giant women. We do not know why they disappeared, though Lorathi legends suggest they were destroyed by an enemy from the sea. To me, it sounds like the enemy from the sea. It was just the sea. They were drowned. I don't know whether the flatlands were bigger, but I don't think they were. The Sea of Mir was maybe smaller, since again there is an estuary, but this is it. In the Dothraki Sea on the other side, we have some of the biggest differences. We have an inland sea where the grasslands are now. 
Sufficient tales survive to convince most masters of the past existence of the Silver Sea, though because of diminishing rainfall over the centuries it has shrunk so severely that today only three great lakes remain where once its water glistened in the sun. Crowfoot's daughter has a great video about the Silver Sea, but I think that at the time she came out with a video it wasn't mentioned what they meant by three lakes and that there is a small mistake on the maps of the lands of ice and fire. When they say three lakes they talk about these three and not these two and the womb of the world. That being said, I still agree with her video, the description of the geography of the area we get, and the fact that many flatlands were created by big inland bodies of water, it makes me believe that the sea was big. It was very big. The question is, how big? Now, the map you're seeing on the screen is before the Doom of Valyria. We see the Silver Sea, even though it's much smaller, but not three lakes still. I fixed the Sarn, so all the Sarnori cities are along the river, and you can see that Valyria is not yet drowned from the dune. I think the sea during the Dawn Age was at least this big, if not even bigger. I don't know if it reads the womb of the world, but I wouldn't find it weird if it was. Considering all this area is flat as a pancake, in the real world many inland bodies of water were huge at some point. For example, as you can see, the Caspian Sea was much bigger, and many of the various lakes in Northern America, including the Great Lakes, were also much bigger. After the Ice Age, there were many big inland bodies of water, so 15,000 years ago, planet Oz, like Earth, was quite different than it is now. Hell, in 15 years, the Aral Sea almost dried up completely, and it was the fourth biggest lake in the world. That happened because the rivers that fed it were diverted, and in the novels maybe we do not have this kind of human intervention, but we do have magic. The hammer happened, and the seasons are beyond fucked up. So the climate changed, and if rainfall decreased to the point where many of the rivers that fed the sea dried up, obviously it would shrink. Extra points for the shallowness, because most likely the biggest part of the sea wouldn't have been very deep. So maybe, yes, the upper part of the Dothraki Sea was actually a sea. Meanwhile, since I mentioned the Aral Sea, the people of the area are calling it Sea of Islands, because there were over 1,000 islands in it. So I think it's possible there were some islands in the Silver Sea. From such we know of the fisher queens who ruled the lands adjoined the Silver Sea, the great inland sea at the heart of the grasslands, from a floating palace that made its way endlessly around its shores. And we know that Gornath by the lake, one of the Sarnori cities beside the Silver Sea, had canals, meaning it was a group of islands and the Sarnori were descendants of the fisher queens. By the way, I will have a video on the Fisher Queens at some point, but I'm calling it now, the floating palace was 99% a ship. Carthine called their ships floating palaces, and it was moving endlessly around the shores. Sounds like a ship to me. If there was such a big body of water in the center of Essos, then communication becomes way easier. Before the hammer, they couldn't pass from the narrow sea to the summer sea. So the easier way was the passage to the inland sea from the rivers, something that, by the way, both the Sarnori and the Roiner did. And not just that, the area where the Red Waste is now was not a waste, but a fertile area with hills and rivers. It only started to turn into a desert around the time the Cathy moved into the area. So we have the Silver Sea, a very close passageway to the Severing Sea, and rivers all around it, some of which were most likely used to transport stuff. Sarn was used like that, we know it. The Skahas at Han is used like that, and this river begins in the southeastern Dothraki Sea and flows southwest through Mirin in the Slaver's Bay. And there is a word there that controls what passes and who. And Hisdar said that it's an ancient title. Long story short, whoever controlled the Silver Sea controlled the trading routes pretty much, since they would allow passage from the Severing Sea to the rivers and by extension to the Summer and the Jade Sea. The other major change that you can probably see on the map is the fact that Ib is a peninsula and not an island. There are various islands very close to the mainland, Ib and to each other. And the second major clue is the Ibanese themselves. At its greatest extent, the Ibanese foothold on Essos was as large as Ib itself and far richer. There is evidence of Ibanese settlements on the Axe, the Lorathi Isles, and along the shores of the Bitterweed Bay, the Bay of Tusks, Leviathan Sound, and the Thousand Islands. They were living all over northern coastal Essos, not just Ib. Most Ibanese now live on Ib and the smaller islands surrounding it, but there are people who live in the woods and mountains of Eben. They make their homes in caves or houses of grey stone which they dig into the earth and do not live in towns. Sounds very children of the forest to me. And oh wait, Eben is the only place in Nessos where they still have stories about the children of the forest. Brian of Old Town encountered Ibanese who said they had never seen any woodworkers but claimed that they blessed households that left overnight offerings 
of leaf, stone, and water. Ibanese of old believed that a man would be cursed if he ventured inland away from the sound of the sea. I think the Ibanese were living along the shoreline all over northern Essos, while the woodworkers, who sound like the singers, were living in the forest that the Dothraki called the Kingdom of Ophikevron. That was most likely one big forest from north of the Dothraki Sea all the way to northern Ib, and that would explain why the very few Ibanese that aren't seafarers but miners live a very similar life to the children of the forest, and why the ones close to the sea were saying the same shit Ironborn say about not being close to the sea. Plus, we do have some sources saying that the Ifekevron vanished because of wars between them and the Ibanese. The Ibanese were and are seafarers, some of the best ones we have in this universe, and for ships to be made, we need wood. I doubt the children would be very happy if they were cutting down their trees. Plus, if this whole area was a part of the mainland, it would explain why the hell called Far Ib Far Ib, when it is way closer than Ib. If it was one island apart from the rest of the area, though, it would be Far Ib. This is it about Central Essos. It's time to move to the Far East, and this is where most areas that I'm not sure about lie. In the north, we have the Thousand Islands, where we can say with fair certainty there was an area that sank pretty much completely. Still farther east lie the so-called Thousand Islands, a Sigurd scatter of bleak windswept rocks believed by some to be the last remnants of a drowned kingdom whose towns and towers were submerged beneath rising seas many thousands of years ago. So the area was a very flat one and the expansion of the plains of the Jogosnai. The Jogosnai are a nomadic people who live in yards, tents and saddles. They are a proud warlike race who prize freedom above all and are never content to remain in one place for long. A similar way of living to the Dothraki. The ancestors of the Dothraki came from the lands beyond the Bone Mountains in the farther east of Essos, leaving behind the bones that give the mountains their name. They are also nomadic and do not have a tradition of settlements. So all these people were living in the huge flat area east of the Bones. But the Dothraki migrated at some point, and I can guarantee that one major reason was this area drowning. This part is very big and was for sure accommodating a lot of people, and after the sea rose, there wasn't enough space for everyone. Under this area, there is the Great Sun Sea, a massive desert valley and a canyon, but back then it was the heart of the patrimony of Hirkun, fertile with various rivers and wells. At some point, big parts of land stopped being sustainable that the Dothraki moved west of the bones. We also have another inland sea, the Shrinking Sea, that is shrinking, obviously, and that leaves the last part of Essos, Yiti and the Jade Sea. The only thing I'm fairly sure of was different is that Leng was a peninsula and not an island. We can see that northwest of Leng is a huge river delta. Deltas are low-lying land areas at the mouths of rivers, and looking at the map, I think there was more land. And since it was flat with a low altitude, it got drowned. Northwest of Leng, we can see another river mouth, and it's pretty much the same all along the shores northwest of Leng, so it makes sense that some part of the shoreline must have been round. The ghost grass coast too, I think, was slightly bigger. We see again smaller isles scattered very close to the shores and southeast of the huge delta there is another river flowing into the sea. From the first time I read the books, I always had the same question, and I still have it. How close or far from the long night did the hammer of the waters happen? If these two events were close, and from what I understand they did happen relatively closely, then obviously the Great Empire of the Dawn collapsed and was never restored. There are two huge areas that sank. One in the north, since we know that from the Severing Sea to the Jade Sea, all land was part of the empire, and one in the south. Top that with a long night and whatever the hell came from the east, and of course they never recovered. And by the way, this is very reminiscent of the current situation with a long night in Westeros, they are already in freaking chaos. 47 wars at the same time, famines are coming, burned areas all over, and crime rates to the gods. All in all, the others are just the cherry on top, not the whole cake. And this is where I'm gonna say that the maps are wrong, because I don't want to lose my mind. All these islands around Great Monarch are so close to each other and to the mainland that if this area rose enough to drown the arm, as well as other places, then the Jade Sea 
wasn't connected to the Summer Sea, at least not there, meaning that the Great Empire of the Dawn was pretty much isolated for the biggest part of its existence, with the northern part of the empire being of great importance, since with two big inland seas and so many rivers, it was the easiest way of communication with the people at the central Essos. Car too would be a key location to add to the empire, since that part would have rivers and a road similar to the current one, making it a great and controllable trade route. Looking at the maps and the terrain, I really cannot decide if there was a sea passage or not, I'm not gonna lie. I, I don't think I have something to add here. If they were that isolated at first, damn, it would explain the fact that there aren't many myths and stuff about the Empire outside of Gideon length, though. But still, I don't know. That would also mean that the area would be connected to Sothorios. And Sothorios is also what the fuck plays. We have Yin, obviously a huge ancient city that is entirely built of black stone, and the description we get, at least to me, sounds very similar to that of Asai, a city so evil that even the jungle will not enter. Yin was the biggest town, but surely not the only one. The whole area of the Basilisk Isles was not islands from what I understand. Again, we see a huge river delta, so we are talking about a relatively flat area, and all the islands look very close to each other. The Summer Islanders have stories saying that they have mapped Western Sothorios and there are people there. And the way people tell stories about Sothorios, there are many ruins in the jungle, not just Yin. We don't even know the size of the continent. Genera Baleris flew her dragon Terex further south than any man or woman had ever gone before, seeking the boiling seas and streaming rivers of legend, but found only endless jungle, deserts and mountains. She returned to the Freehold after three years to declare that Sothorios was as large as Essos, a land without end. The Toad Isle has the Toad Stone, again a huge oily black stone idol, and there are people there, people who are described very similar to the ones in the Thousand Islands. The people of the isle are believed by some to be descendants from those who carved the Toad Stone, for there is an unpleasant fish-like aspect to their faces. The area at some point in history was not as unfriendly and there were big civilizations flourishing there. Because something like Yin is not built in a year or two. There was an advanced civilization, and the place is also a very good one, considering that it's between Essos and the Far East. Nath was always a very isolated place, so I think that they were isolated even then. Maybe the island was bigger, but still separated from the rest of the lands. Summer islands were bigger, still islands, again, just not as many. I'm gonna say they were three or four bigger ones, Summer Islanders have been excellent seafarers since the ancient days. There are even rumors that before the Giscari or the Valyrians, the Summer Islanders have founded cities in Sothorios. Lomas Longstrider, who visited the Summer Isles in his search for wonders, recorded that the sages of the Isles claimed that their ancestors once reached the western shores of Sothorios and founded cities there, only to have them overwhelmed and destroyed by the same forces that wiped out later Giscari and Valyrian settlements on that perilous continent. As we can see here, the whole planet was quite different. It was not just the arm. I would even say that the arm itself is one of the smaller changes. The breaking was the catalyst for the whole domino effect that happened after. But looking at the before map, we can get some very important information. First of all, if indeed seafaring people like the Ironborn, the Hightowers, etc. reached Westeros prior to the first men, then it makes sense for them to settle on the western part of Westeros. Taking a ship from the southern shores of Essos towards Westeros with the arm intact, the only places someone can settle are the Ritz and the Westerlands. The whole east part of Westeros was not accessible, and Dorne was and still is a desert. Of course the Fisher Queens were that powerful, they used to control the main trading route, and I think that the Inland Sea was this big. The amount of jokes and references and parallels we have with the Dothraki Sea and the ocean is crazy. Plus, if we think about it, the Dothraki and the Ironborn are kind of the same, they raid, they do not sow, they don't like forests and trees, they are the rulers of their seas. Maybe Victarion saying I will sail the Dothraki Sea wasn't just a joke to confirm once more that Vicky is not the sharpest tool in the shed. Maybe it was a clue. And obviously the Dothraki are afraid of the sea and they say it's cursed, since most likely one of the main reasons for their migration was that the area they were originally from drowned. The maze makers vanished because Lorath suffered quite a big hit, and I talked about it in my Squishers video, they most likely suffered raids too, and 100%, if the Great Empire of the Dawn was such a great and far-reached empire, they wouldn't recover after the hammer, and soon after the long night. I'm gonna stop here because, holy dude, this was a lot. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it though, and didn't get bored mid-video. 
The next one is gonna be shorter, much shorter, either about House Durandon and Storm's End or about the Pact of the First Men and the Children of the Forest. If you like this video, press a like, comment your thoughts and subscribe if you haven't. Until the next one, bye!